Before we get going, I want to make you aware of one thing. We've launched Clip Notes. Now, you know that, but let me tell you what's going to happen. You're going to get busy, and you're going to miss a couple episodes. You're going to wonder what happened. Wouldn't it be great if you had an email for each episode that had key moments in bullet point format so you could just view and see what was said on the show. You could see who was on the show, and then it had one to four short clips of one minute to about three minutes of key moments from the show that you could share with your team or that you could just watch real quick. I know that happens to all of us. I know we get busy. That's why we designed Clip Notes. It has been a huge success. We have over 500 people have signed up in less than, uh, I think, five or six weeks at this point. So we're really excited about it. You can sign up as well. Sign up on any episode page on thisweekhealth.com or send a note to clipnotes at thisweekinhealthit.com and it will kick off an automated workflow to get you signed up. Welcome to This Week in Health IT, where we amplify great thinking to propel healthcare forward. My name is Bill Russell, healthcare CIO coach and creator of This Week in Health IT, a set of podcasts, videos, and collaboration events dedicated to developing the next generation of health leaders. This episode and every episode since we started the COVID-19 series has been sponsored by Sirius Healthcare. Now we're exiting that series and Sirius has stepped up to be a weekly sponsor of the show through the end of the year. Special thanks to Sirius for supporting the show's efforts during the crisis and beyond. I've been wanting to do an episode on fire, but more specifically, I've been wanting to do an episode on developing an application around fire for quite some time. Uh, and I just haven't gotten around to it. And in today's episode, we are going to be really diving deep into fire. And I'm excited to have uh, Dr. Kevin Malloy with the uh, MedStar Innovation Institute, for, uh, Med, MedStar Institute for Innovation, MI2, uh, on the show. And I became aware of him. He and I connected. He's a, a listener of the show. We connected a little while back. He has shared some stuff with me. Uh, he has since produced some videos. He uh, has some meetups that he pulls people together who are looking to, to write fire apps. And I thought, great opportunity to have a conversation around what it takes to develop a fire application in healthcare. So here's the show. Hope you enjoy. All right, today I'm, we are going to explore a topic that I have been very interested in for a while, and I found a, I don't know if I'll be offended by this, but I found a doctor who's also a nerd and informaticist. Uh, Kevin Malloy is a doctor. He works for the, he works with the uh, MedStar Institute for Innovation, MI2, and uh, I'm looking forward to having this conversation. We're actually going to walk through the process of developing my first Fire app. So Kevin, welcome to the Thanks. show. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm a long-time listener, actually. I think what you're doing is great. I appreciate that. I'm, it's, I actually recorded my 300th episode today. So we're recording a little bit before it will, will air. Our, our episode will air. But today is actually the day. September 8th, we aired our 300th episode. Hard to believe. Cool. So th thanks for being a listener. But I am, I'm really jazzed about this because uh, some people know this. I, I was a CIO, I am a CIO, but I'm a really a CTO by training. I started my career as a developer. Now, we don't write many DBase apps anymore, or DBase 3 or DBase 4 apps, or Foxbase or Fox Pro apps, but, but I still have some of those skills. And I was wondering, can I translate some of those skills into uh, where we're going? But before we get there, give us a little background of your background with regard to fire development and what you've been doing. Sure. So probably like you, self-taught in kind of web, like HTML, JavaScript. When I was in med school, I was fortunate enough to be able to learn how to code in a way with a group at uh, MedStar Health, led by Mark Smith, who's now the chief innovation officer at MedStar Health. He's an ER doc, and I randomly reached out to him being like, I'd like to learn how to code. And he said, sure, come over and we'll have somebody teach you. So I did a month with him and I swore I'd like never do it again. I don't know if anyone else who you're like, it took me like a month to get the number two from the database onto a web page or something like that. <laughs> and I was reading the JavaScript Bible. I don't know. It was like this thing that was this big. And it was right around like YouTube videos coming out where you couldn't learn the code on your own and stuff like that. But I swore I'd never do it again. But then I ended up doing residency um, inside of his emergency department. And I started realizing that there's a lot of cool stuff I could make for myself when I'm practicing clinically to, to just make the job easier and keep patients a little safer. 
So I started making stuff in web and HTML in a system called the Zixi at that time, which you had invented, and it subsequently got sold to Microsoft and was Amalga. Now it's Keradyn. So I started making web stuff. Flash forward uh, to now, um, I still work at MedStar, but the web technology stuff is still applicable because of Fire. And Cerner and Epic, a lot of the stuff behind the scenes is actually like web-based in a way. But Fire is like 100%, it lends itself 100% to web as well as iOS and Android and that type of stuff. So what I do day to day, I still see patients clinically and I'm still able to like dog food my own stuff that I make. But I also um, chaired a fire steering committee at the health system. Yeah, about quarterly, we meet up with the CIO, the CMIO, the CNO, kind of make sure our APIs are on track. I also host a bunch of educational sessions throughout the health system. And the idea with those is that our goal at the Innovation Institute is to catalyze innovation. So we don't necessarily get consumed five years from now. I'm probably not going to be doing fire anymore um, because it's just going to be the way things are done in the organization. But what we do now is we catalyze. And one way to catalyze is by educational events for people who are coders out in the enterprise. So like people from radiation oncology or radiology or custom dev team or like core team that type of stuff, just to have an educational event for them to learn how to use fire and kind of incorporate it into their. Yeah. And, and now, and now you're doing meetups on helping people to. Yeah. Yeah. So I, as a little side project, I'm trying to teach patients how to code to use the fire APIs because one of the observations, I don't know about you when you were doing DBase and stuff like that, the, the best way to learn is to have a problem and patients have the problem of whatever's going on in their healthcare journey. So I try to teach them how to, if they have a problem, how to actually use fire to maybe help them in some way or a family member. Well, um, well give us an idea of some of those problems. So what are some examples of the applications that you've written and what are some problem sets that lend, lend themselves well to fire where it's at today? Yep, yep. One thing, probably the starter and where we started with this was just installing like uh, inside of your environment, the, the basic growth chart app, which is like a provider facing app where providers in Cerner or Epic and they click a button and it opens up this fire app and you don't know you're using a fire app, but it's code that's written by uh, Boston Children's and it's free and it pulls in the height and weight and makes this really nice uh, graphical user interface for the doc to plot out. The, the growth chart for the patient. And then there's like a parent facing one so you could turn the screen around and they can look at it. And then you can print it out for the parents too. So a lot of people start out, I think, and we did too, just with the growth chart app and like an open source available app that you can plug into your EHR for providers. The other thing, people I think probably then move on to um, some kind of single sign-on stuff. And the way Fire works, it's actually Smart Fire. There's a way to authenticate, and then there's a way to get data out. And what you can do is use that authentication mechanism to embed something that you are here on to making providers go into like a browser window and enter their username password into, and then pull it up over there. So an example at MedStar was one of the really early things we did was uh, embed our antibiogram, which was this little website that was outside of our EHR. We embedded it within the EHR and you just click on a button and it opens and you don't have to put a username, password or anything like that in there. Some other stuff we've moved on to is we're using FHIR for research grants. So there's a large human factors uh, group at MedStar Health that got a LEAP grant from the Office of National Coordinator. And what we were able to do with them was to embed a risk calculator inside of the provider's workflow. So in Cerner, there's a, a little workflow thing you can scroll down and one of those they usually have like meds and conditions and like upcoming appointments that type of thing and we're able to put a box there that was actually a fire app that calculated their uh, cardiac risk score so you're using it a fair amount internally you're mm -hmm. the same quite frankly the same way we used to build access databases is what you made it just sound like it's like okay. not quite as insecure and they're not quite as messy in the back end, but yeah. almost as easy. It's sitting there going, look, if you know how to access APIs and you know how to create a, a single sign-on, you're going to have access to this data set. And then you can embed it wherever you need to embed it. And you can launch it on a mobile app or on a, I mean, anywhere you need to uh, launch it. That's what you're making it sound like. And again, you're educating me, so feel free to correct me. No, no, absolutely. I don't know if you ever went to any training courses at like Epic, like I did physics 
position builder. And I went there and it struck me that there's this whole educational system built up around training and maintaining your EHR because it's so custom. The cool thing about Fire is that it's all just regular web technology. If you have a regular web developer, you can just point them at this spec that's um, online and they can go at it. They don't really need, they, they need maybe a little like bump of energy to get them over using it. I've taken people within an hour, I took one of the radiology people and now he's integrating Fire data into the packs. He knows a bunch of web. So it's, it's not, I think one of the things that is unique about Fire is it's existing stuff that people already know how to do. It's not like I got to go and do something about M page development or CCL development. It's just web development. All right. So you're going to walk me through this uh, and we can go in two directions. I'm going to go in the easier direction first. Okay. And that is I work for a health system. Sure. So I work for a health system. We are, uh, we're just like everybody else. So we have multiple EHRs. Yep. We, have, we have a clinically integrated network that has some Cerner. Our core system might be Epic. Yep. Uh, we might have some uh, touch works and that kind of stuff. Uh, but I have this idea for presenting a, a set of metrics of some kind across the entire clinically integrated network. What okay. questions, so I'm a physician, I'm sitting there going, oh, I'm listening to this podcast. I know that I can do some things with fire. Yep. What kind of questions do I ask at this point? What kind of questions can you ask fire? It's a good no, what kind of questions would I ask my health system? Like, how, where do I go? How do I access it? Does every EHR automatically oh, yeah. have fire turned on? Is there yeah. certain versions of fire? I, yeah. where, where, where do I start? Yep, yep. If you're at a Cerner Epic shop, you just go to fire.cerner.com or epic.cerner.com, and it has all the documentation publicly available to tell you how to use the authentication and what data is in the APIs. Like they have a list of all the available APIs, like the ability to read documents or to create documents in the EHR, the ability to read labs, the ability to get radiology reports. So ability. is there any chance it's not turned on or is it just, is it required to be turned on at this point? Yeah, yeah. So that's Cures Act is you got to have these APIs to be a 2015 certified EHR technology to be 2015 certified and to report in MIPS, you have these APIs somewhere. They are probably turned on because you're probably attesting to like MIPS information blocking stuff. So more likely than not, they're turned on. If you have physicians or parts of your team that are interested in building stuff with it, really you just need to check out the documentation at like fire.cerner.com or fire.epic.com. And you got to, like internally, you got to make some stuff like in Cerner, it's in PrefMean. You got to change a few things to get stuff to show up, but it's relatively a, not a heavy lift. So, so it, it, there has to be a target, right? So internally, I'm going there to get the documentation, but yep. internally at MedStar, yep. there's a URL or a target to, to, to get to the data or get to the APIs, correct? Yep, yep. Yep. So, so MedStar will have its own fire URL and let's say Beaumont will have its own fire URL and Hopkins will. You can actually see some of these if you're interested in them. If you go at least for the Epic shops, they're at open.epic.com and you can go to fire endpoints and you can see all the patient facing endpoints. They're not going to be the internal provider facing endpoints because fire, depending on who you are accessing it, um, will give you different information. Like it'll give patients the ability to read their information, but providers, it'll give the ability to like create and, as well as read information. But the URLs themselves, at least for patient access, are publicly available for Epic. I think Cerner is going to be coming with that in a little bit because it cures. For the provider one, you probably have to reach out to um, like your internal IS team although you could figure it out. We have a lot of IT listeners right now who cringed and a lot of other people are like, yeah, tell us how to do that. Yeah, uh, so. you can, yeah, yeah. The, the interesting thing about uh, fire, the, and I remember we were talking once about plumbing and how fire is like plumbing. And one of the interesting things about fire is you're probably thinking of your organization as everything behind your firewall. And there's a few public access like points and whatnot. But by its very design, Fire is has to have a public access component so that patients can access it. So your provider APIs are probably just piggybacking off of those in some ways. So a lot of this stuff is beyond your firewall. And, and it's probably a different way of thinking about your EHR and where it's like touching and where your plumbing is going. 
because it's going out into the in the into the World Wide Web. Which is not to say that it's this is like something new for the World Wide Web. Google. Yeah, we've been doing we've been doing this for eons essentially. Yeah. And it's really just OAuth 2 plus the REST API. That's all that this essentially is. And it's technology that people already use every day in a very public fashion. All right, so let's level set here. It, not all data is available, right? What kind of data sets might not be available? Yep, yep. Why don't I step back and just say that, just to underscore a point, that there's three main roles to get data in FHIR, right? There's going to be a patient-facing role, so that's me, I'm a patient, I log in to FHIR with my, my patient portal username password, and I can read data about myself. Right now, I currently can't write anything, but I can read stuff out. And this is what Apple Health uses, right? The Apple Health integration that a lot of health systems have uses this patient access. I can only see my own data. I can see stuff like radiology reports, labs, vital signs, stuff that's in the US CDI the U.S. Core, con core data for interoperability, all that stuff patients can access. The second role is a provider access scenario, which is a physician, I am either in my EHR or I'm not in my EHR, and I can use FHIR to get the same stuff patients can get, labs, vitals, radiology reports, plus I have these other abilities, which in Cerner is I can create an encounter. I can create a patient. I can patch a patient and update that their address is no longer valid. I can create clinical documents and have those appear in the normal places where I would expect those appear to appear in the EHR. So the provider access role um, has access to pretty much all the information that patients can access, but the ability to create a lot of things. So the patient we're not creating, uh, we don't have create, create rights yet? essentially? No, no one, I, I haven't seen those. Um, yeah. No, but, all right. So I want to go back to something because you just said the way that Apple does this, that's probably the easiest mechanism, right? So I can connect really to almost any health system in the country, as long as they provide a portal, because I'm going to use that portal authentication for the patient. And then I'm going to, I don't know, create new ways of viewing that data, create new ways of utilizing that data through my app. Is that close? Yeah, what I would say is that if you were doing it with Apple Health, like Apple Health internally on the iPhone has its own set of APIs that's interacting with the data that's stored there. If you're a health system and you want to create your patient portal V2, like basically you would have them sign in with the same username and password, and you'd have access to a lot of the same things you can do in a portal, except the messaging the docs. There's the ability to create appointments and stuff like that. So one way is, yeah, you could put it on a device on an iOS device and then build on top of that um, using Apple's APIs. Or if you're a health system that's very forward uh, looking, what you could do is just roll your own new V2 of your portal using these APIs, the same username, password, and you could create novel visualizations. You could bring in novel APIs. You can create different experiences focused on different patients in particular using a lot of the data that you're actually going to see in the, in the portal. Are, are you finding that health systems are struggling with this concept of, because it feels like you've just created a window yeah. into the EHR data set, yeah. which is, as we know, it's just loaded with a lot of value and those kind of things. Or are they seeing it more as we're unleashing the potential of the creativity of the health system to, to do things that we just, We'd wait too long for Cerner and Epic to do it, and we can now do it ourselves. Yeah, you, I can really only speak internally about like where I work, but I think it's seen as a, a driver of innovation, potentially, to direct to patients, as well as provider experiences. Yeah, it's really interesting that you can... I, I, I wasn't under the impression that you could create, I guess, through the provider side, you can actually create things. That really does open up a whole new host of things. And actually, it reminds me of the conversation we have with John Halamka, where he said they, for the Acts the Facts initiative, they redirected all their faxes to, to AWS fax server, essentially. Oh, yeah, and it yeah. took all the stuff in and it, it took all the data and it was just searching for prior authorizations or some aspect of something. Yeah. And then once it found it, it would then go into the record and use fire to just check one box that says authorization received. Oh, okay, cool. No hands touching, no, it was really elegant, but that's the kind of thing you can do. You can sit back and go, 
oh, look, yeah, I can check that box. I can, we already have a ton of technology that's available to us in the cloud where we, we can scan these documents, we can pull it, we can pull out the unstructured data and the structured data, we can then review that, and we can even apply AI and machine learning to it and then do things in the EHR. Now, we, we've got to be careful, obviously, yeah, we're yeah. dealing with the medical record. Yeah, but I think something you're pointing out is that FIRE itself lends itself to this automation process, right? Because it's standardized across the HRs and um, the spec is open and what you can do with it is you can just go, you can look on fire.turner.com, fire.epic.com and you can actually use a lot of this to automate stuff that's happening in your cloud. I would say that's absolutely correct. So it is a standard, but we have different versions of the standard. This is what I learned. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. is there a difference? And which one are we most likely to see today? Oh, yes. So there's different flavors. So there's something called DSTU2, which is a draft standards for trial use two, which was the original one, which most of the patient-facing applications use today, like Apple Health uses it. That was the earliest version of this. Then there's something called STU3, which is the standard trial use three, and Epic uses that, Cerner doesn't quite use it. Um, then there's something called R4, which was release four, which is the Cures Final Rule says that within two years, everyone needs to be on R4, right? It's actually backwards compatible. So if you write something that is doing AI, OCR in the cloud and shoving something into your EHR, if you write it in R4, supposedly five, 10 years from now, that will be compatible with R10 or whatever. So R4 is like the most backwards compatible. It's not supposed to break going forward. Um, now, are there, are there any rules or context to how I'm gonna use the data? So I can now use Fire to get access to the data. Mm -hmm. This is one of the concerns, right? I could just suck a lot of data out and then start to yeah. utilize that data. Yeah, the, Fire is really good for kind of one patient at a time scenario, not necessarily I'm trying to get a population or like I'm trying to get all the patients who have CHF in my organization. Those um, queries of patients, like multiple patients at once, is supposed to be supported by bulk fire, something that's supposed to come out probably within the next three years or something. It's in the final rule somewhere that the EHR vendors need to offer this. But currently what it's good at is like one patient at a time. So if you were if you were sending something to AWS for some AI thing, OCR, you know, text to, what would it be called? Image to text, yeah. And then shoving it in one patient at a time, that's something Fire can do. But if you're looking to pull a cohort of people who had that done to them, that would be hard for Fire to do. It's better at one at a time. How does the community look at this point? You, typically, you have a development community around. If I were learning Java, I can find a ton of communities and resources around this. Is that starting to really form around fire at this point? Yeah, there's, there's a bi-yearly conference called Dev Days that's put on by Firely. And some of the Cerner engineers I know go there. They do talks. There's, it's this international conference where people who are the nerdy people about fire, like all congregate. <laughs> and uh, they also have a YouTube channel. If you check out Firely on YouTube, they have a channel where they post all the talks and like Josh Mandel has a talk on there from the last dev days. And some of the people from Cerner have stuff up there about like CDS hooks and all the stuff that they're working on. So there is a rather strong community um, behind it. Yeah, so you, you've put some stuff out there um, yeah, yeah. yeah, so t talk about some of the things you've done. Yeah, so I won't say that they're uh, very successful, but one of the things I'm trying to do, and we talked about it, was... You're comparing yourself against the wrong things. So people say to me, how many downloads of your podcast you get a day? I said, well, about between 800 and 900. They're going, oh, you're no Joe Rogan. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> but there's only this many people who care about health IT. Joe Rogan's <laughs> smoking pot with, with Elon <laughs> Musk. That's entertaining for everybody. That's a different... Well, now we know what you need to do on your show. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. If you get Elon Musk on here smoking pot, then I'll, then I'll lose my health IT audience. I mean, what's he talking about? Uh, you'd be surprised. No, but uh, yeah, so I put this thing out there and it's called patient.dev. And the idea is that there's people who are patients or or family members, people with patients with like chronic illnesses or going through something. And most web developers know how to use Fire. They just need a little push to um, actually start using it. 
So I have a bunch of videos there. It takes about 30 minutes to go through them about how to make a patient facing app and like just walk you through registering your app. And um, here's some sample code you could use to actually create it. Because I think, I think a lot of the innovation from the patient facing stuff is going to come from family members, patients who have these problems that they can solve more readily. It, it makes me think of the makers movement. Every once in a while, there'll be somebody talking about, hey, I was able to do this circuitous thing to get all my data from this, and I graphed it out, and I realized that this was associated with this. I think those are going to be, th those are trivial to make with FHIR, especially with um, healthcare data from a major health system or LabCorp or, or anywhere like that. So. I'll tell you, one of the one of the panels that I didn't feel like I belonged on at one point, I, I, Anish Chopra was was moderating, Lee Shapiro, who was uh, with Glenn Tolman back in the All, All Scripts days and now does Seven Wire Ventures, was on it. The founder of Box, whose name I can't remember right now, yeah. but he's a colorful cal character, really fun and, and whatnot. Anish is, is, he's bringing the audience in. So everybody, it's at the uh, Health Evolution Summit and, and the audience is getting into it and this woman stands up in the back and she goes, this is the problem I need you to solve. And we, we had a topic, we were talking about something else and the entire topic devolved into interoperability. Your EHRs are killing me essentially is what she said. Yeah. And uh, her daughter had a chronic condition. She had been to Mayo, she had been to uh, UCLA, she'd been to multiple organizations in Southern California yeah. uh, where I was a CIO. And she was essentially saying, look, I now carry two to three binders, or I'm working on my third binder, but I carry two binders with me, and it's the complete medical record because you guys can't share it amongst each other. And then I go to somewhere else, and she goes, I'm just terrified that someone's not going to read the whole binder. And I, what, I, what I was afraid to say to her is, you know what? Almost no one's going to read that whole binder. It's two binders already. It's too big. Yeah. But that lends itself, that specific scenario is – what FIRE was created for, the patient who's saying, look, I'm going to 10 different organizations. You haven't figured out how to share my data. Let me gather all my information and create an app that I can share it with the physician when I get to whatever location I'm going to. Yep, yep. And there's probably going to be a whole suite of tools for providers to visualize that data in a very quick way. They're going to need to become essential with all this interoperability happening. We tried at MedStar to do this in ER because I, I work in ER. Like my observation is like people come in and they have, they're a MedStar patient and they have 300, 400 documents in free text, like just sequentially ordered or time ordered. And you can only show 20 at a time with an EHR, but maybe they're there for chest pain. And the, you know, the thing that's relevant to chest pain, like they had a blood clot five years ago, and now they're off anticoagulation. That is buried in like document number 356 or something like that. But it's not on the top 20. And if I'm a, you know, if I had all the time in the world, I could look through and try to read all this stuff. But it's better to set up like a little algorithm that's always looking for stuff that's pertinent to why that patient is, is having that visit today. So we set this up. It was fire enabled at one point. We did it with a partnership with Booz Allen because they had some data scientists um, that were helping us out. And it, it was an interesting experiment in like, how do you actually, once you have all this data in one place, how do you make it actionable at, to, to a person, make it relevant based on why that person is actually there? Because they're, if they're in the ER for chest pain, it's different than if they're there for a headache. And there's different pertinent things that we're looking for. I think more things like that, like we, we got it, we trialed it out in production and we got some positive feedback, but part of the thing was it just took a while to run and we never quite got around to prefetching everything and setting up. Um, Do you think we'll see user groups get stood up at, at most health systems as people start to get more familiar with this? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I think because fire, you can be at any health system and essentially use the same code across systems it'll probably be like it'll probably be like this week in health IT workshop on or use a group about because it, it spans I, I don't think it would be focused within the organization itself but it'll be more a bunch of organizations since there's no it, it's standardized and you don't really need it, it like, like uh, it, it doesn't rely on a code set 
specific code sets that are only in your EHR to work. It, you know, you referred to some code that was open sourced earlier on. Uh, it was Boston mm -hmm. Children's, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, yep. Is there other code out there that's been open sourced that people can look yes. at? Some of it is. There's that smarthealthit.org. If you check it out, it's run by Boston Children's, but people can put their apps on it. So I have one or two up there. And you can look at how other people are doing this. Some of them are open source. Some of them are like commercial, but that's probably a good resource if you're looking for some. You know, the thing is, if you're using open source code in a healthcare system, you probably want somebody to review that code through your normal <laughs> pathways, right? Yeah, that that would make sense. What what other what other resources would you what, like? Where would people find your stuff, and what other stuff would you yeah, recommend um, people look at? So my stuff is at uh, patient.dev. I have a few videos. They're a little more targeted towards patients. Periodically, I have a meetup group, DC Medical APIs meetup group, that we periodically do a workshop where we, I think, a, you know, we. So like we've had people talk about bulk fire from U.S. Digital Service and the person was the CTO for an East Chopra for a little bit. So periodically we do stuff in that arena. And if you happen to be a Cerner client I, or use a Cerner EHR, I actually have a kind of bi-monthly meeting that I do for, because I feel like in Cerner, our flavor of fire is, we probably all have the same problems with it. So what I try to do is set up like a little workshop every once in a while, every couple of months, or have a speaker come and talk on something every couple of months. So if you happen to use Cerner, that might be high value for you. Like we had a niche uh, Chopra talk uh, a couple of months ago, and then we had a, a workshop on making an app a couple of months ago as well. Awesome. I, you know, I hope you're uh, patient.dev, right? Is that what you? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I hope it gets a few more hits. I will probably uh, head, head over there and uh, download a couple things or watch a couple things. I'm really curious because I, I think this does have the potential to, to really create a, a, a new environment within healthcare that we can be very creative uh, within standards, right? Within security models, within standards, which is uh, that's going to benefit the providers maybe address some of the some of the challenges of, of information overload and and burnout, uh, and then on the patient side, the even the use case that we gave of being able to transport your records. So uh, yep. a lot of great opportunities. Um, there Kevin, thank, thanks thanks for your time and thanks for all your work that you're doing in this. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for for all you do. I I learn a lot by listening to your podcast and hearing all the other uh, all the CIOs, CMIOs, and how they're thinking about stuff at their organization. So it's really high yield for me. And I appreciate all the work you do in amplifying. I think that's your you, <laughs> yeah. amplifying. Amplify uh, great thinking. So <laughs> that puts you in that category now. You are now great thinking. I'm getting yeah. amplified. Make, make sure you tell your family that I, I, was, I was put in the category of great thinking today. They'll humble you pretty quickly. They, they always do for me too. You'll have one extra su subscriber, my mom. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, my, uh, it, it's so funny. I, I, I talked to my parents this weekend. It's, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't listen to your last podcast. I'm like, I can't believe they're listening to all these. I'm like, I, they, I, they can't possibly understand a bunch of the stuff that we're talking about. But right. invariably, they'll call me up and say, hey, look, my medical record went from this system to this system and this happened and we're now using Epic and here's the portal and here's, and I'm like, they're at least grasping from a patient perspective, some of the things that are now, that happened to them behind the scenes from a technology perspective. It's been really yeah. fascinating well, to watch. You put on a good show and the Newsday thing, I think is relevant to, to like even your parents or just normal people. It's just, here's this, here's how you think about what's happening in this news article. I think it's actually it's reachable to a more general audience as well. So Yeah, it's fun. It's fun. And it's great to uh, meet and talk to people like you. We'll have to, have to catch up. So you'll have to develop some really cool apps between now and this time next year. And we'll catch up to, to get an update on how things are progressing. Excellent. Sounds good. Thanks, Thanks so much. much. That's all for this week. Don't forget to sign up for our clip notes. Send an email, hit the website. Uh, we want to make you and your system more productive. Special thanks to our sponsors, our channel sponsors, VMware, Starbridge Advisors, Galen Healthcare, Health Lyrics, Sirius Healthcare, Pro Talent Advisors, Health Next, and our newest channel sponsor, McAfee Solutions, for choosing to invest in developing 
the next generation of health leaders. This show is a production of This Week in Health IT. For more great content, you check out our website, thisweekhealth.com, or the YouTube channel. If you want to support the show, the best way to do that, share it with a peer. In fact, sign up for Clip Notes, get those emails, send them on to uh, your team members, peers within the industry, and let them know things that you have been getting value out of. Please check back every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday for more shows. Thanks for listening. That's all for now.